Ciao, Paisani, and greetings from Italian America. You'll notice Rose a little busy today, but Pat and I decided to take a guy's trip down to the charm city of Baltimore, Maryland to show you the Italian side of this wonderful town. Rose is writing another book that I'm not in, but we're just going to leave it at that. And she's just getting you back for not yeah, coming to Brooklyn. Right, it's retribution. It's absolutely <laughs> retribution. But she doesn't know what she's missing. We've got people to meet, places to go, a lot of great food to eat, and my pal here, who happens to be a world champion bocce player. A local bocce, a local champion. Lo local, local champion. Gentle correction. Local, gentle lo correction. A local champion bocce player is going to teach me all he knows about the Italian-American national game. So it's going to be a good one. That's why we came down here. Indoor bocce courts, that's like my whole dream world. It's going to be a perfect day to enjoy some guy's time. I know you're going to miss Roe, but we'll try to make it up as best we can. So let's make our way to Little Italy. We're going to have uh, a good time. Let's start. We're definitely going to have a good time. Absolutely. So with Ro taking the day off and John taking some time to work on his bocce skills, I, your gracious host, Pat O'Boyle, am finally getting a well-deserved turn in the captain's seat. Now, if it were up to me, we'd spend a full episode on the bocce courts. But to be fair to the lesser athletes amongst us, we're going to mix it up a bit and instead try to answer a simple question. What makes a Little Italy? In Baltimore, it's an enclave of roughly 15 square blocks and it's now populated by the descendants of some of the country's earliest Italian settlers. Their roots can be traced back as early as the 1840s and consisted primarily of immigrants born in the areas around Genoa, Naples, and the Abruzzo, and in Sicily, Cefalu, and of course, Palermo. Some sailed into the port directly, and for others, it was a train ride down from Ellis Island. But to everyone, it became home. A strong and close-knit community of our fellow Byzans whose traditions and tremendous spirit are still ever present today. And for us, we figured we'd start right at the heart with a visit to St. Leo's Church and a quick talk with their pastor, Father Carmen. So, Father, can you tell us what year the church was founded and, and how the Italians got here? Church was built in 1880 and opened as a parish in 1881. Initially a German-speaking community that dispersed, if I understand right, fairly soon after. But a group of Italians came over, landed in the port of Baltimore, intending, if I got it right, to go west for the gold rush but they didn't have all their documentation. They were told to stay here. So they established themselves, got going. This became their church. And then first the diocese, the archdiocese, and then later our community made sure that they had priests here who could speak Italian and work with them. The church itself is named for the fifth century Pope, Pope Leo I, the Bishop of Rome, and as many consider him, one of the most important popes in the church's history. Most know him today, as St. Leo the Great. The one thing that's always remembered of him was at his time, the Roman Empire was beginning to fall. Attila the Hun was coming in from the north, ravaging the countryside. When he was approaching Rome, Leo rode out to meet him. And Attila was so impressed with him that he agreed to leave the city alone, wow. turned and, and went back. So that's one of the things he's most remembered for. It's an incredible place, and like I said, really the heart of Baltimore's Little Italy. And not just geographically. Well into its second century of existence, St. Leo seems to be the centerpiece, not just for spiritual nourishment, but also for many of the Italian-American traditions our communities hold close to their hearts. Thanks, Father. We'll be back. We met up with neighborhood native and former Little Italy Advisory Board President Ray Alcaraz. What better way to see and learn about a place than with a guided tour? At this point, we were well overdue for a fine Italian meal, and Ray had just the place. All right, Ray, we asked you for your top recommendation as an expert on Baltimore's Little Italy. You are the expert, and you've taken us to Chipparelli's. I've got this beautiful, famous chip salad in front of me. 
tell us why Ciparelli's and what are we eating? Well, it's one of the oldest uh, restaurants here in Little Italy. Um, you're having a chip salad, which is known worldwide. Um, and I think um, the ravioli here is my favorite. And I think you'll enjoy that. Um, and this is a, a multi-generational restaurant. Uh, third generation now owns it. And um, it's just old school Italian. And it's perfect. There's no one who loves old school Italian eateries more than you do. No. You're the world expert. You are the encyclopedia of old school Italian yeah. eateries. You call me Anywhere Johnny in America, Red Sauce. I'm happy. Johnny Red Sauce. That would be yeah, a like great that. name, Johnny Red Sauce. I could do that. I'll take that. You could that. have a checkered. Checkered Red and white checker yeah. table cloth. I can shirt. mark it with sauce yeah, everywhere we go, like on the arm. It'd be perfect. I love this. I love a place that's family owned. It doesn't have to have a fancy interior, good, hearty soul food for the Italian American community as many generations as possible. That's like my, my heaven on earth. So I'm happy. I'm looking forward to this one. I'll tell you a quick story. Um, this was set up a little bit differently when I was a kid, but I used to deliver medicine from the local pharmacy to uh, Mr. Ciparelli and, and, and pretty much, you know, everyone. Um, and I was standing in the bar one time waiting to get paid, um, and this guy comes up to me, he said, what's your name, kid? And I said, Ray, he says, get the kid a drink, get, a, get him a soda. And, and I, you know, it was Rocky Graziano who was buying me a soda because he was hanging in the bar. The ravioli really hit the spot and were especially right up John's alley. But for me, this day was all about our next stop. Now, not to shortchange La Scala, because we could honestly do a whole episode just on their cannolis. Thanks, Nino. But when you've got an indoor bocce court, it's going to tend to steal the show. This is what we drove three hours for, an indoor game of bocce. So just for those of you who are not familiar with the game, there's, there's a lot of uh, theory that it goes back 5,000 years before the birth of Christ, the ancient Egyptians. We know the Egyptians played a game. Um, if it was not exactly like bocce, it was very, very similar to it. it. The Greeks played it, they brought it to the Romans. So much of Ro what Rome had, they took from Greek culture. And it's basically, in a lot of the Anglophonic world, it's referred to as lawn bowling. So this is the key, this is the star of the show, it's called the Paulina. And the Paulina is a small ball that's thrown out. And two teams uh, bowl, they throw out the balls to get closest to the Paulina. The team, with the ball that gets closest to the Paulina, gets the point. Now you can get, if you have one ball that's close to the Paulina, you would get one point. Or um, if you would have, let's say, all, th all four balls could get points. But the key is that your ball, if, I show, if John can help me, your ball has to be close enough that if there's not an enemy team, an opposing team ball that's closer. So let me give you a, an example of this. If we had these balls like this next to the Pauline, green gets one point because red is as equal or closer to the Pauline than this green ball is. If we remove the red ball, Green gets two points because you have two green balls close to the Pauline without a red ball that comes closer. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. We'll try to keep this game as friendly as possible, though I can't help it if the inner champion me decides to peek out. We should have had the priest come and bless the balls. <laughs> <laughs> all private. Like I said, I could spend all day on that court, believe me. But before we hit the road, we figured one more solid pit stop was in order. This time we decided to try a bit of a newer place for a taste of authentic Sicilian focaccia. And what we've been told are some of the best meatballs in the world. Or at the least on the block. Joe, everything sounds spectacular. So what do you recommend we try? What are we gonna have here? So obviously, when you have a slogan like best balls on the block, you're gonna try the balls, right? Yeah. You have no choice. We're in. So we're gonna do the balls with a little burrata mozzarella cheese melted on top. And then we're gonna do two of the, probably the biggest traditional uh, fogaccia mezzeres is a little bit of eggplant. And another one's gonna be my, uh, my homegrown house pickled 
peppers. Oh, that's fantastic. Little escarole. You're gonna eat it up, you're gonna love Can't it. Can't go wrong with that, let's go. Joe opened his now famous Joe Benny's in 2014 as a means of sharing some of his favorite Sicilian hometown recipes with the people of Baltimore. And of course, to be part of Little Italy's famous history. I love the neighborhood. You know, I always wanted to be a part of this neighborhood. So I've only been here 20 years. Mm -hmm. I'm from DC originally, but I always wanted to kind of do something and be a part of a, some sort of Italian tradition, you know, very proud of my heritage. So I said, you know what? I was in my 30s. I said, what better time than that? Let's do it. So I went, I learned it, you know, how to do the, the fogaccia, the meatballs, all my family recipes, you know what I mean? So it wasn't that hard. <laughs> And then uh, we just went with it. So now, uh, eight years later, and everything, thank God, is still going strong. Yeah. We came for the focaccia, but we stayed for the meatballs, and trust us, they lived up to their name and then some. Now let me ask you, your yeah. meatballs, yeah. They, you, you use a breadcrumb base, which is very Sicilian, am I correct? Absolutely, with yeah. Neapolitan's yeah. Campania, we use a soaked bread. Yes, you do. That, that is our base, but your yep. base is the typical we, Sicilian we do a bread. breadcrumb. Yep, and sometimes I'll even throw, not sometimes, I try to make it every time, I'll put a little bit of my fogaccia. Oh, my fogaccia oh, into, oh. I, I throw it in the oven, the leftover, I make it hard, I crumble it, and we toss it in there. So. It's got a little olive oil. It's got a little moisture going in it's there. It's like right? it's like it's it's like your focaccia squared. Yeah. It's like your focaccia in paradise. Exactly. Now your focaccia meets a happy pig, and they make love and they produce they produce this meatball. I never had listen to me. I've never this heard meatball. my referred to as yes. quite in such a manner, but uh. you got to come here just for the meatballs. The meatballs <laughs> and the bread. We're eating ourselves. Dare I say into a coma today? Oh, they're fantastic. So what do you think makes a little little? Is it really little more than a few blocks of great food in our beloved tricolor displays? Or is it something else? Something that instinctively brings us back and greets us with the warm nostalgia of our incredible history and amazing culture. Ray, what keeps you here and what keeps you coming back, advocating for the neighborhood, promoting it, fighting for it, why? Because it's home. Um, you know, growing up here when, you, when everybody was your family, it's home, so you can come back at any time, and you're still home. But I love the neighborhood, and I stay put. God bless I'm you. Going, I was born there, and I'll die there. God bless you. It's like my mother. Every neighborhood in this world changes over time. But for Italians, our roots are always strong. And our rich traditions have so far passed the test of time. But it's up to all of us to continue to preserve this gift that we have been handed to share our wonderful heritage to all who seek it. And to make sure that for many years to come, Little Italy's all over this country provide everyone with the indistinguishable feeling of coming home. Well, Ray, you've shown us amazing sights throughout Baltimore's Little Italy. So much to see and do, so much that you clearly love and people that you clearly love. But I think it's safe to say, of all the places, this is the most sacred. Your family home for four generations, almost 100 years, a house you were born in, house your mother still lives in. It's the intimacy of this neighborhood, I think, for us that makes it so inviting. And everybody has been so gracious to us. And I feel like we're part of a family here in Baltimore. So I highly recommend everybody come out and see this version of Italian America, this great place, and it's got so much to offer. And, and I know you're a fan of Rosella. I'm sorry we didn't have her with us today, yes. but uh, next time we'll she bring- She missed a great episode. She did miss she a great episode, a great episode. yeah. Episode. I'll tell her to visit anytime and you guys come back as well. I think she's afraid that the Sicilian focaccia is better than the Baris. <laughs> it's probably you true. You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> well, we take it to see Giuseppe uh, over there. I think uh, she she's might get a lot run to learn. She's got to run for money. <laughs> Well, okay. I, and I just want to say it was such a pleasure to get to meet you and get to experience this neighborhood with you because your love for your people and for this place is so it's 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 so inspiring and it inspired us and we're happy that we got to share that with you. So thank you very much. Yeah, my thank pleasure. you for thank the you. trip. Thank you for the time and thank you for all you've done for Baltimore's Little Italy. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is a great Come town. Visit. Come see Ray. He's always taking people around. There's plenty of people to meet. Lots of great food to eat and wonderful people to interact with. So if you've enjoyed our adventure in this corner of Italian America, make sure to follow, like, leave us a comment, and come back next time as we bring you more greetings from Italian America.
the Tiger Woodabashi. You are. And it's going to teach so me. Even at this age, we're still trucking.